Good. Yeah, almost want to have uh, my screen just a little bigger here. Okay, good. So, uh, welcome everybody to my talk on uh, characterizing the Spearwood Valley Aquifer. It was actually, I, I put it to, I presented this at Sagic, it was a 15 minute talk. And, uh, well, before I get into it, yeah. So, when uh, Emmanuel, like three weeks ago, asked me to be a keynote in the um, groundwater session, uh, I'd originally, I actually thought my, my keynote would be the groundwater. So, uh, but I thought about it and I said, well, you know what, I mean, I've given a groundwater talk at least once a year for the last 10 years. Although I don't consider myself a groundwater specialist, I have given enough talks, so I thought I would give it a go. And what I've decided to do was, what's, in the 10 years that I've been giving the talks, I've been talking about, uh, the VTEC system has been evolving. And as a matter of fact, I'll, I'll, I'll say this, that after we, after we designed the, the V10 Max system, that very, very high dipole moment system in 20, 2009 or 2010, since then, almost all the R&D effort on the V10 system has been dedicated to getting a better early time data for groundwater work. So, we, uh, so what I decided to do was actually present a talk on the evolution of the V10 system as a groundwater mapping tool. So I hope you'll bear with me. So, I want to just mention uh, my co-authors, uh, Ted Ash and Jerry Abraham from Acrogeo Frameworks in Denver, uh, Zihao Hong and uh, Kimmy Khaled from, uh, from Geotech, who, uh, who are my, my, my um, colleagues uh, there, David His, H. Scott Parkin, Parkin, and Rex Honeyman at the North Dakota State Water Commission, who've been champions of, uh, of uh, airborne electromagnetics for groundwater for several years with us now, so I want to recognize their efforts. But anyway, here's the outline of my talk. I'll, after I give you my little brief introduction here, I'm going to talk a, long, a little longer on the uh, evolution of these 10 system for groundwater applications. And then I'm going to talk about the Spirit of Aquifer project. I'm going to give you a little background, the, the previous survey, what it showed, and so that you can put it in perspective how the new survey is showing different things. Because the two, the two areas are, that we flew, although they're contiguous, actually gave very quite different responses. And I'm going to show you results of airborne yen versus rural geology, airborne yen versus red city sections, and then uh, the box on the plants before concluding. So the V10 system, we know it's a, it's a versatile time to mean electromagnetic system. It's, <coughs> It's, uh, it's a time dominium system that's known, it's always been known for its deep penetration and high signal for noise. That's, that's it's renowned. But as a matter of fact, the V10 system has been in constant development since its inception in 2002. It's constantly changing. If you're a client, you know, or you're trying to model V10 data, you'll, you'll, you'll know that it's frustrating. The waveform changes slightly, and, and the system has been changing as well. It's not static. And actually, in 2007, we had actually flown more than 1.5 million line kilometers in V10, and that was that's like what a space of five years. That's not a that's not a long time, and that's a lot of kilometers. So it it was it's one of the most widely used airborne EM systems. It's it was primary its primary use at that point was mineral exploration, and it constituted as much as 99.9 percent .9 of its activities. I would say probably less than one out of a hundred. Uh, or 200 were, uh, or even less than one out of less than one out of 300 were uh, non-mining at non-mining surveys. But so because it was mining, at, to think of it, like at that time, it was the push was let's go deeper, let's see deeper, let's see deeper. That's the demand from the client. So we the, the focus on of our R&D development was on increasing the dipole moment because that's how you get deeper. It was also lowering system noise levels, particularly leak channel noise. That was the focus, right? And because that's the greatest importance for our mineral exploration plants at that time. The focus was on late channel data quality. At, at the same time, although we were interested in the ground, groundwater market, we knew that, you know what, that the system really wasn't at that point really well designed for. We didn't measure data less than 100 microseconds. And, uh, uh, and so, and, the, and those are, uh, get, getting data less than 100 microseconds in, in, in time to medium is, really, is what's important for shallow selling and mapping. I mean, we just thought we did a, an adequate job. So, but we did do some work, and I'm, I'm citing this, this paper by, uh, uh, by Martinez, um, Karim Martinez at Kofi in, uh, in Denmark. 
And uh, it was a paper, uh, it was a study that uh, they were involved with, and they, they invited us to the, the, uh, the butane system to, to map the Cal Calahari freshwater and saline brackish sand aquifers in the Okavango Delta in Botswana. So for this survey, as a matter of fact, the VTEN system that we used was actually custom. I, re I remember Palpatician, the engineer, actually went all the way to Africa, and he adjusted the system so that it would be tuned for that purpose. So, and so you see right here now, like they just this is an example of a, of a decay curve in a, in, a, in, a, in a log log plot. We don't, we, uh, and you'll see here, the earliest time we had was 42 microseconds. Whereas the standard V10 system, we weren't actually delivering data before 100 microseconds at that time. So if you look at V10 data pre-19, 2000, pre-2012, it's 196 microsecond, 100 microsecond data. This was a really unusual data set. And here's the Okavango Delta. It's, it, this is every, probably this image, this dendritic image. These represent channel systems. So you get basically fresh water within a, that's perched within a, because it's layered, it, it's perched within this a, a saline uh, sea, brackish water. And uh, this is what the uh, uh, LCI, just the, the uh, Lateral constraint inversion sections look like. So you see in, in here the resistivity goes from it's a linear scale. Sorry, uh, looks like my pointer mm -hmm. just died. My pointer just died. So anyway, just if you look at the look at the section, the, the LCI uh, red is resistive here. So you've got this groundwater that's resistive, it's non-conductive, it's pushed above that brackish water. And I, what I'm showing here is a profile. Is it going? Thank you. What I'm showing here is a profile, and there's an island here, and there was actually a high. Well, it just died on me again. I agree. Intermittent. Yeah. There's a, there's a saline pool, uh, and it's way there. So, and that was part of this conductor, right? So you've got this resistive water in the middle of the island, you've got this high salinity pool that's in the middle of the island that we have there. That's a really interesting uh, result. And this is, I remember uh, seeing this, this image at, uh, at AEM 2008, and Kareem presented this. These are depth slices from 10 to 15 meter depth, 20 to 26 meters, or 33 to 40, 42 meter depth, and you can see the progression of high resistivity and low in this uh, uh, channel pattern. Thank you. I hope so. The, the channel pattern here, uh, really well illustrated, and that was from Kareem's paper in 2008. So uh, you know we, we were doing ground we were doing groundwater work, uh, and actually recent research I remember uh, attending uh, ASCG and ADM and Jim McNay had been pre presenting data and said and he, they demonstrated the calibrate, calibration accuracy of V10 in mid to, mid to late delay times. Let's say 100 microseconds to 10 milliseconds, right? At the same time, there are other other orders that were seeing issues of the early time data. Uh, for example, Davis and Groom uh, at SCG 2009, SIG 2010. If you know, like Ross Groom, that guy's a that guy's a brain. He flags something. He's going, you know what? There's an issue here with your early channel data. There's a there's a there's a 15 percent difference in amplitude between the model curve and the and the measured curve. And he also remarked that there was greater than 50 percent amplitude difference between the observed and the model data in the early channels. And this one we could explain. It was it had to do with the, the uh, current waveform, the amplitude, the current waveform that he was using. It wasn't the right current waveform. But this was undeniable, right? And that's at seventy microseconds. Seventy, yeah, seventy microseconds. So we had to do something about it, right? So what do we do to address this issue? We, we let's 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 get let's try to get better uh, early time data for when we're doing uh, groundwater mapping. So the 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 what we tried to do was actually develop what's called a, an early channel system. That early channel system was basically a new receiver. So it was developed in 2010, it was just for groundwater work. It, 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 was, it was a new receiver coil, uh, fewer turns, and no X coil. It had, and because it had fewer turns, it had uh, an increased bandwidth. Fewer turns, you get better bandwidth. So there was reduced early time dispersion. And it had, we were using a shorter uh, transmitter waveform, 
and with a faster turnaround. So we hope that would help. And as a result, we we felt that, you know what, we could get data down to, I don't know, 0.03, uh, uh, actually that's not true, that's 30, it's 30 microseconds, not 30, uh, 3 microseconds, that should be 30 microseconds, my apologies. And those improvements led to, uh, led to reliable data in that, in that decay range, versus our 100 microsecond, 0.1 millisecond uh, radius channel limit from the fork. Now I want to show you an example. This is a really interesting one. This is a, it was from a, it wasn't a shootout, but the, you, Paul Petros from the United, uh, uh, United States Geological Survey did a comparison of airborne YAM systems over the south plate. It's in, it's in Nebraska. So what we see sure here is, is we're comparing sections. The first section is resolved data. So, and here's the resolved data that they've calculated the depth of investigation. So it's actually imaging, you see it's imaging the upper surface really nicely, but lacks depth of investigation. It's less than 50 meters. In at the sky time system that was flown, it has this it, it's it's defining the, the upper portion where you see well slightly different in spots. These are all uh, uh, colors on the same. And in uh, they didn't have a no depth of investigation limit were set here. So I don't we don't we don't know exactly where the depth of investigation was. But the, that square is about 200 meters at that time. And the V10 down below, you know, we're seeing that based on the depth of investigation, we're seeing the 350 meters. Everything is going great, and you know, we're 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 mapping the deep uh, the deep uh, paleo aquifer that we believe. But there's a, there was actually a problem. You know, there's a little conductive layer here that's not in any of those other ones. And as as a matter of fact, I remember uh, at, it was at the Sajik in 20. It might have been 2011 in Denver. Uh, that's what it was, yeah. Uh, uh, Paul uh, put up a put up a poster and he and he pointed out that hey, listen, guys, actually your your data is not just your your data is actually not just 100 microsecond, but there's there's actually a distortion in the data up to 10 milliseconds, right? Or one millisecond, sorry. So. And that, so that's def, that was definitely worrying, and uh, that that spurred us. Like that was the the great thing about working with the USGS geologists and geophysicists group is they give you feedback on your system, and it's, it's they want to work with you. They want to work with you to get a, a better system. So I mean, we that, that was actually the, the motivation that we needed in the effort to address that issue. And we're based on we said that's it based on the issue uh, on the research by Jim McDane and uh, and Baron Hay from 2010. Geotech developed, let's go the full Monty, the full waveform system, which to improve early time data and achieve quantitative measurements out of the turnoff. It was developed and tested in early 2012 to improve early time data in both the V10 Plus system and what would be known as our V10 Lite system, because that was the lighter weight system that came out. And a significant feature of the system were we streamed half cycle recording of transmitter receiver waveforms. We did a pre-systems uh, uh, and sensor calibration. That's something we didn't do before. There was a continuous system response correction applied to the data. There was a transmitter drift and parasitic noise correction applied to the data. And there was an ideal waveform deconvolution. All of that was done in the post-processing stage. We later had to abandon the, the, uh, the waveform deconvolution because it was unstable. And it, we found that it had a minimum effect on the data in terms of improvement. But anyway, that this full waveform, and that was done within the space of less than a year. So that, that and that's, that, that was, it, that actually got us to 18 microseconds. And uh, we, we've remained at that since we've developed this new system. So we're very, very pleased with this. I'm going to show you the example of that. Here's a close-up of a waveform. This is down a high altitude, right? So there's no Earth response. So what you're seeing is pure system response. I've got the uh, transmitter voltage, it's turning off. You can see that that's in green here. You can see how it's, it's actually, that's what our turnoff time is, but you can see it is triple current. It's hard to get rid of, when you're pumping a lot of current in the loop, it doesn't go away quickly. It dissipates, right? And it, as a result, the receiver, all, it, normally you've got to turn off T0, T that it should be dead, right? But it's, it's, you still, it's still uh, affected by that current in the, in the transmitter. So you can see that's why we had to 100 microseconds about there. And that's why we had to take our measurements out of 100 microseconds because of that. I'm going to show you the result after, after the full waveform process. We have a, it may not show it here, but actually it's a much steeper turnoff. You can see there's much less 
excess current here, and the turnoff is actually steep, steeper, and the uh, there's the decay curve sent, and we can actually get closer to the edge of the turnoff. And that's the, it's the same data, but we we, we apply the full waveform process, so it's a digital it's a digital process. And from that point on, this is an example from the uh, survey that we uh, undertook. In uh, in February of 2013, the following a, couple, a year, a couple years later, for the city of Brandon, they were they wanted to map their uh, their uh, the, the aquifer, and what we found was we found what we were called the Brandon Channel Aquifer. There absolutely no indication of them on the surface, and there they are. They're incised channels right outside the city of Brandon, and there's no evidence of false surface conductors in the uh, due to system response to the V10 data. So that's what the full waveform allowed us to do. But we know if you're doing groundwater work, it's a very demanding industry, and uh, they they want shallower and shallower, better and better resolution. And so we know that, uh, and we know that sampling earliest possible transients is critical for shallow near surface uh, application. It's not just the depth; it's also the bandwidth. You, you see a much much broad. The closer you get to the turnoff, you see a much broader range in resistivity. Jim McNay actually showed that in one of his papers. Uh, the, with Esther Baron, uh, with Baron Hay. So, oftentimes when we're doing groundwater work, sometimes that 18 microseconds is just not enough, and we want to do more. So, following that development uh, in 2011, like almost like five years later, we came up, we, we developed another system, the V10ET system, in 2016. And it, it, it looks remarkably like our V10 Plus system, but it's a much smaller loop, it's a 17 meter loop. We've got an auxiliary loop here where we can put uh, laser uh, uh, um, and uh, other other uh, ancillary uh, sensors because we don't like to put anything on our loop, not even the transmitter. And it's, it's consistent. The new system is a brand. It's completely different. It includes a redesigned broadband receiver sensor. It has a completely redesigned, reconfigured transmitter system, and it has a new digital acquisition system as well. So it's and it also implements the full waveform processing. So these changes have allowed V10ET to, to achieve distortion-free measurements as early as five microseconds. Doesn't seem 18 to five doesn't seem like a lot, but in groundwater terms, it's big, right? And so it's a new it's a new category of V10 system, specifically designed for precise near surface applications like groundwater and environmental. Actually, because it's more broadband, we've actually tried using it in in uh, in. Um, in gold deposits as well, because it has a much better, greater sensitivity to a broader range of resistivities. So there's spinoff. This is the evolution of the VTEM in 2016. So we've got the, and this is a spin spinoff here because the survey I'm presenting to you, the first part was actually flown with a VTEM plus system, a typical two turn 26 meter loop, four, I should say four turn 26 meter loop, 600,000 uh, amp per meter uh, uh, dipole moment. And then versus the V10 ET, which is an 18 meter loop, two turns only, and a, 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 almost a quarter of the dipole moment. And these are the specifications that, that compare the two. But the one that's most important is are these. The length of the current ramp with the V10 Plus, our standard system is one and a half milliseconds. That's what, and that's great for Andre and uh, uh, Andrea and the, the IP effects that he, that he likes. The new system has a half a millisecond turnoff, much faster. Uh, in terms of time channels, we have we have we were sampling closer to the and closer to the turnoff. We have many more channels up from fifty five versus forty three. Our earliest time channel is five five microseconds, as I told you, and eighteen microseconds on the old one. And the sample rate that's a big one, almost a megahertz sampling, eight hundred almost nine hundred hertz uh, kilohertz sampling versus the, the V ten plus at two hundred kilohertz. So we're taking a lot of samples of data. Now I get on to my Spirit Roof Valley presentation. That fish should be good. So very valued aquifers consisting of uh, permeable sand and gravels in, uh, in glacial and bedrock valleys are actually an important source of groundwater in Canada and the United States as well. And buried valleys, uh, valley aquifers are actually difficult to define because they're partially eroded. You can't see them. Right? They're, they've, they've been overprinted by, they can be overprinted by various uh, glacial in Canada and the, in the northern United States, glacial various glacial and uh, lacustrine overprinting, right? And oftentimes they're hidden amongst other sand and gravel aquifers. 
in a thick overburden that should cover. So the, the, there was a, the investigation of the Spearwood JT Aquifer in Jamestown in 2016 by the North Dakota Water Commission convinced them that airborne time and medium would, could be used for aquifer mapping and characterization. I wrote about it in the paper in 2017. So following the success of that survey, they commissioned two more helicopter-borne EM surveys, near Wapenden in fall of 2017, and at Spirit itself in 2018-19 that I presented earlier this year. So that's the, these are the, this is the uh, new survey that we flew. The Spirit was up, block consists of 2,400 2, roughly blank kilometers of EVM coverage uh, that we flew on uh, in a corridor that's roughly, this is like 15 to, uh, to 45 kilometers. Uh, and this is about 100 kilometers north-south, so it's a quite a large area. Uh, from uh, just south of Jamestown to Ellendale. And advanced processing and inversion of the EM data, complement, complemented with integration of the existing geoscience data, like well data and hydrological data, has imaged the aquifer there in 3D and has provided the state with an enhanced framework for the groundwater management. They, they, uh, that's what they use it for. So the survey area lies west of the Rest River Valley. So the Minnesota and, and, uh, and North Dakota are separated by the Red River here. And so this is a, a map of the geology. And on this side, these are, it, it's like Precambrian basement, it's resistive. And then my paper at Wapen in the show with the, the, all the data, the basement was just a, over here, these are Cretaceous, they're shales, so they're conductive. So you see the basement is conductive here. And as you move further west, you get to turn your rocks with, with very different um, uh, resistivities as well. So within the survey area, glacial drift aquifers, aquifers excuse me, are generally composed of sand and gravel, deposited by glacial activity. And most are located either near the surface, but are deeply buried. So the geology of the surface are mainly Port quaternary uh, glacial lacustrine in embedded sands, silts and gravels, but there's also clay tills and silty clay. So you've got the, the aquifer material is resistive and the outside material is conductive because it's clay. So they stand up quite nicely. And there's sedimentary for, uh, formations near Jamestown that, that uh, these formations actually uh, uh, overlay Cretaceous Hill up to 600 feet deep, as I showed. So in 2016, we carried out this survey in, in Jamestown. Uh, it was about that. So the year previous, this is with V10 data. I'm just trying to set it up here. We almost 2,000 light kilometers. And we flew it in, in less than a couple of weeks. That's what it looked like. It was similar, but these 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 lines were much more regular, right? And we learned from this because it did. We 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 crossed a lot. We lost a lot of data because of the power lines. Okay, thank you. And so we, when we did the design of the new survey, we changed. This is the uh, flight path over the Spearwood Aquifer. This is what the map aquifer looked like in blue with all the drill based on drill information. I'm going to skip through these. Anyway, this, the goal was to better characterize the aquifer boundary and the geometry of the Spearwood Channel and understand transverse till aquifer. So you can see these are what transverse are. This is the main Spearwood Aquifer. And these are called transverse aquifers that, that are also important that they didn't know a lot about. So this is what the map looked like. This is a 20 meter depth slice. And so what this is, is you've got mixed soils. You've got some sand and gravels. You've got some, uh, these are like uh, swampy areas. And basically it's a mixed soil that dominates the EM response, moderate resistivity. When you go to 70 meters, these, these are resistivity highs. These are the sand and gravel uh, layers that are dominating the EM response. And as you get to 110 meters, this, these are all, the, all this purple is shale, shale bedrock. But you can see here, you see that? That's a transverse, the cross-cutting channel I was talking to you about. So just a, a blow up in that area, we did a, we were just looking at a section across. Here's the main spearwood channel, here's the secondary channel that they show up, and they're incised channels. Cool. And the client was elated. They, they had indications of this in their well data, but they didn't know where they were. So having the EM plot for them was, was very important for them. Now I'm getting on to the 2019 survey. I should be okay. Uh, we, we flew with the V10 ET system because they suspected shallower aquifer material. At the, previously, the, the, most of the aquifers were deeper. Here they thought they, were, they would be shallower, so they wanted the V10 ET system. We flew almost 2400, over 2,400 kilometers in December and March. We couldn't fly in January. The weather was very, very bad. It, it's either blowing like stink or it's snowing like stink. You can't fly at all. We basically had to send the crew home. 
hmm. and take a month break and then came back to finish the survey. We, they, they, we initially flew with reconnaissance coverage every two kilometers and five kilometer space tie lines. So here's the old Jamestown JT data set. This is the new Jamestown South data set right here. So here's the V10 data, early time, mid time, late time. So these are almost like pseudo conductivity maps. You can, you can in early time, anything resistive has a low uh, EM signal. So you can you can basically see this, uh, the, the, you can picture the meandering shallow aquifer. At mid time, it, it's slightly water, and at deep time, there, you can act, if you look, if you squint here, there's actually a, a kind of like a deeper anomaly here. So whatever's conductive denotes high conductivity. I'm almost ready. Actually, I'm almost out. We, we inverted the data in the, in the workbench, and we, we fit ge geophysical logs to the data. These are the, the uh, comparisons with borehole data. They basically color coded the boreholes so that they match the red, the resistivity uh, sections. So here, if you don't notice the boreholes, because the the data matches. In this case, it matches perfectly. Over here, there's we were identifying one, but it looks like there might be two. And over here, we've overestimated the resistivity of the first hole, and we've, we've identified the second hole. So there's good there's uh, the lower uh, resistor. These are resistors, right? This is after processing and editing, we perform spatial inversions. And we, we invert them with 40 layers, with, and they all started at five ohmmeters, so it's equivalent to a five ohmmeter half space. We increase the lay, thickness layers logarithmically, and we set spatial, spatial references. This is all stuff that Ted would uh, understand, and it gave up what he felt was a both reasonable and constrained result. These are an example on the north end. Now you're seeing this beautiful aquifer layer, and this incised paleo channel. That's a paleo channel. And we've got borehole evidence to support each one of these layers and the depth of bedrock. Here's the one, uh, I'll have to skip through these, I'm sorry. This is the next line to the middle line, so you've got a, this aquifer layer, and here's a deep sand layer, and there's that, there's that bone of contention because the hydrogeologists thought they, when they drilled, all their drill holes stopped at the sand layer because they thought they were in the basement, but they weren't in the basement. In fact, they had one drill hole that extended all the way through. So this was a big breakthrough. They didn't know that existed before. They have a big aquifer there. And then finally, for the south, this that big, deep, thick aquifer comes is thins out. It comes closer to the surface. This is a schematic. That we're just looking north in the a 3D model, and it shows these discrete channel deposits that we see in the north. There's a second area that's dominated. That's, there's a big, thick, he's taken off the top layer. There's, there's the thick uh, sand aquifer in the middle. And further south, these, the aquifer thins out. So that's what's shown in these 3D maps. Very, very colorful, very, very interesting. These are the elevation depth slices. Basically, they're elevation. Uh, one, 1,300 feet is shallow and 1,100 feet is deep. So you can see that fabric that, that's developed in the channels and, and shallow depths, and at mid depths, we got this big, deep, resistive alluvial fan, and at, and at greater depth, it's, it's thinning out as we move further south. I'm almost, I'm almost done. So, to conclude, helicopter uh, EMP was acquired over the Spiritwood South, and it's been processed and inverted with lottery constrained inversions to produce a resistive image of the subsurface geology. The inversion outcomes provide a much clearer and more detailed characterization of the buried aquifer geology and other stratigraphic units than previously thought. They provide an enhanced framework for groundwater management. And that data set is rich in detail from the geology from surface all the way down to the Cretaceous basement. And there, like I said, there are three areas that, that we found. There are not so many of those cross-cutting structures that we saw in Spiritwood North. But there's a, there's a real variation in the uh, subsurface geology. I'd like to acknowledge and, and thank the North Dakota Water Commission for allowing me to present these results. Thank you. Thank you.